Hey, how are you doing? Hey, what's up, man? You claimed a drive yesterday. There will be very yeah. little sleep. Why have you not been sleeping very much? Yeah. My brain is way too excited and too much stuff is happening. Yeah, I get that. All right. Uh, unfortunately, I have only 30 minutes and I believe Slava has too. Uh, so maybe we, uh, Slava can actually kickstart. Um, I hope Ali will, will join the call. We have Pranjalaya here and we have... Uh, Zuki, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Um, so yeah, Slava, if you can take a lead, that would okay. be great. Okay, hi everyone. Okay, so um, now we are coming to interesting point where um, we have some some infrastructure already, and uh, we can use it for different use cases and uh, for different research even, and. Um, I've got approached by a research group from um, Amsterdam and uh, they're interested to, to uh, understand uh, how, how it can be reusable uh, for their use cases. One second. Life. Life. Yeah, gosh. Hey, yeah life happens. Knitting as well. Okay, sorry. Uh, so, uh, That's all right. yeah. So basically, the idea to start to collect historical data on Spanish flu. So it would be nice to get some some data on something that happened uh, more than one hundred years ago, and to see if we can actually uh, find some common patterns with uh, COVID nineteen. And uh, well, I did some, some some like basic research and already found some sources that they in some sources that uh, they already provided very interesting information. So basically, it looks like a news uh, that published yesterday, but it basically published like 1919 or 1920 about empty streets and about people suffering from uh, Spanish flu and uh, some historical data how many people got affected and uh, it's quite uh, i would say it's quite similar to what's going on now and it's uh, interesting to understand if uh, we can actually um, we can start to collect this data right now and uh, we can use uh, this as historical research in, in and we, we we can compare with something uh well some to get some insights also uh, and uh, find some some common patterns with, with what happened long time ago and what is happening now and probably after some time it will be possible even to predict what will happen next based on on data that, that we'll collect so yeah i don't know how you feel about that but um i'm, I'm personally i found this really fascinating because we are kind of traveling back in time and in the same time because we feel uh, also threatened by COVID-19. So we, we can feel it really close what happened a long time ago. Yeah, I mean, I've been watched, I've saw some documentaries and some recent documentaries in general and the, the Spanish flu and the, the, the flu of 1919-1920 is one of the only real modern models we have for what is happening. And that's yeah. one of the reasons why uh, social distancing, like, plans that's one of the things that have inspired the social distancing models is because they understood that social distancing worked then because we had very little else to fight it with so that's some of the things they've implemented but it also informs some of the models on when to relax social distancing as well because there's different cities in america relaxed them at different times and they had second spikes and sometimes the second spikes was much worse because they relaxed them and didn't react to things and, and there's yeah we do have references but obviously we need to take into account that you know the whole world's very different as well and things happen mm -hmm. faster and transport is much more pervasive and communicate communicable but yeah i think it's an interesting point i don't know how much we could add to the story that's new 
but it might be an interesting way of extending um, our understanding of right now with historical references and models. So yeah, yeah. I, I, get, I definitely get the, uh, the value of it. We can learn from history and we should definitely do that. And uh, we need to find some. We need to find some historians. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, I was also very surprised to see uh, in historical sources to see exactly the same cities that got affected right now. And uh, like in Spain, it was mostly uh, Madrid and Barcelona, and was like wow, and Valencia. Wow, that's something interesting. So basically, it's like uh, the same history uh, appears again and. Uh, well, I don't know about other countries. It looks like uh, we also have some patterns because, like, uh, it was mentioned that Germany was not really affected by Spanish flu, but uh, other parts of France, for example, like central part and northern part, got uh, very affected. So it's very interesting to just to see if we can uh, merge some data and we we can just just do analysis so to understand. I, yeah. I had a look at uh, the general trend over there. So I think, I believe there were two uh, peaks or the two kind of, uh, um, the, the, first, uh, the first wave was in some, in India, for example. First it was in the uh, month of June and the second was in August and September. So uh, what happened was initially only the older people and uh, uh, those who were more Weaker in terms of their immune response, uh, mm -hmm. they they were affected more. But during the second phase, even the younger people were affected by it. And uh, one of the major thing was that this had a lot of impact on the imperialistic policies of the British. Mm -hmm. So, post that we there was a lot of uh, like in, in, there was a lot of uh, anger against the way. Um, this uh, epidemic was handled and taken mm -hmm. care of. That actually, like one of our uh, like freedom fighters was Mahatma Gandhi. He also got sick during this period, uh, and he good thing was that he got well also. And then there, there was a lot of people who uh, became quite angry in the way that things were handled, and even British were not that able. Then we had the world wars, so. It kind of like pushed us towards uh, becoming more um, like go, going against the British rule out here. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's a lot of historical, historical significance to um, the, this. Yeah. Uh, the, anything that's a, a major crisis um, creates. Uh, it creates opportunities for both the powerful to take advantage of and for the weak to make changes. So that's one of the reasons why political upheaval and political changes. And yeah, the Bengal famine is a prime example of it. It's something that British culture is kind of dealing with right now because there's lots of protests over here with extensions to the Black Lives Matters movement. And I've always quite happily criticized British Empire and imperial, uh, imperialism. Uh, the, the but was in so many people don't. Yeah. Okay. Please no, it's like the there's a lot of rose-tinted uh, glasses on empire, so it's an interesting thing. But it, it would be an interesting um, thing to look at, especially if we can find data. I feel like data is going to be a bit harder to find compared to. I mean, we've the countries are good at record keeping things like deaths and tax records, but much mm. of, much of empirical data is probably a little bit more limited. But um, it'd be interesting if we could find, reach out to some his, you know, history places, especially uh, historians who are interested in that period, because they probably exist and they might be able to bring Yeah, yeah. Context. The, the, there, are, there are different groups actually uh, doing research on this topic. And what, yeah. what I found very interesting, so, well, I can read Dutch indeed, and uh, from Dutch sources, I've discovered that, discovered that basically texts, they're not quite, they're quite the same as now. So you can see the same uh, lemmas and uh, the same words basically describing the same events. So I really believe that uh, we can even reuse uh, all those uh, medical models uh, that we already have to get to, co to collect some data from historical sources. And of course, we should train new models and uh, we already have some capacity for that. We have Dakana basically that uh, deployed this production service and now we have possibility to deploy 
the Kana instance for every team who's interested to use it. So uh, there are a lot of opportunities basically to start to do labeling and to create new models. And uh, especially for me, it would be nice to understand if it, if it will be possible to use the Kana, let's say to get uh, data sets extracted directly from historical texts. So if you'll, if you'll see some, some sentence that uh, like, like 100 people got infected, so 100 people should, should be going to some data set and uh, after the, we'll do processing these hundreds of thousands of text, we'll get basically exactly the same data sets, but on historical, in historical perspective. Like so this of, is this is kind of its own little investigation about historic, you know, historical models to try and update our models. So we've got an analogy to reference stuff, but it's mm -hmm. also uh, somewhat of an extension of knowledge, the knowledge engine idea as well of testing our discovery systems in a different knowledge base, exactly. as in historical information. And obviously, historical information is just human information. People forget that. It's just all just human stories based on human text written by people. It's not like we're trying to train it to, you know, do anything different other than translate and, well, understand the context of the written words. So the, a lot of it will carry over. But it's an interesting because we'll be starting to branch into more social sciences and a bit more subtlety and a bit more inference, especially with um, older, less... Lessly, less readily available data, but more reliable in the sense that it's not going to change. You know, we don't have to worry about their data updating this week. <laughs> it's, it's not, it's yeah, not yeah. happening. We can, we can practice on a stationary set <laughs> rather than a constantly moving one. You, yeah, you know, it sounds uh, interesting. You know, uh, what I found also interesting because I did, uh, I took a look in like 20s and up to 30s and up to 50s. So I found actually different data about the same uh, countries. So I think they did kind of recalculation because uh, also it seems that some people um, got registered on different diseases. So it was not, not written like Spanish flu, but after some evaluation that, you know, they did uh, in historical uh, perspective, they uh, changed um, the estimation so I think it's also interesting to understand how actually people uh, they um, they calculated this amount of affected people after like fifty years. Yeah, but again, it goes back to historical understanding because history yeah. informs. I mean, we're gonna we're gonna have this exactly the same this this COVID nineteen in fifty years if we survive as an entire species in fifty years and and. Um, we're going to be having the same thing where old Chinese data that was documented is actually going to give us some much more accurate numbers and, and we're going to have an actual idea of what they said rather than the, the editing of history that's happening right now. And same in America, same as everywhere. This is not a dig on China. This is just like Britain's doing it. So I have absolutely admit that every country's massaging the numbers and, and trying to downplay some things for their political, current political you know reasons rather than actually wanting to be honest and real there's, there's lots of mess involved with social sciences mm -hmm. but that's what i like about it yeah and uh, there is a really nice question about good sources for historical data and i think it's our first assignment actually to get all these historical sources to be collected in some kind of format and i already have uh, sources for netherlands and belgium because i asked people and it would be nice to have the same for India, for Great Britain, and uh, for United I States. I imagine, not, not, to, not to penny pinch, but I imagine Britain's pretty good at documenting it because they do love documenting things. We have mm -hmm. been rec recording everything for a very long time. Mostly everybody else's wealth, but that's not the point. <laughs> but yeah, I imagine British records are pretty strong. Some parts of the world might be not, not so much, especially at that during that period. But it was mm -hmm. just after World War One, so um, some of the systems of understanding the country have been implemented. But just before World War Two, there's a really good record system. I mean, I would for a little while we're doing family family research and records, so I might have a bit good idea to find some historical records for deaths mm -hmm. and stuff, which might link to it. I'll have to have a look out and see what I can find. Mm -hmm. And also, I think it's quite relevant to what Akash already did uh, in his research of social media. 
because I found really different data about the same uh, cities in like in, in different newspapers. So let's say in Dutch newspaper, there is uh, some, some article about uh, Spanish flu and it was written in one source like 100 people, in second, 120. So it would be nice to understand how they actually did estimation and uh, from which sources it's coming. Because it's, <laughs> it's not clear at all. They're not actually uh, providing any references. It's just basically like small news uh, article about uh, what happened and that's it. So it's really interesting to understand uh, uh, how it was covered in, by, by, even by different countries. You know, like, uh, for example, in the Russian Empire, they uh, actually uh, denied uh, Spanish flu for some time, and uh, they booked, let's say, all people on other diseases. But in reality... Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. Yeah, probably they died from Spanish flu. So it's, <laughs> it's really interesting to understand this also. I mean, I mean, is this probably a similar sort of thing happening right now in the sense that supposedly general influenza deaths are down because COVID is getting people, either COVID is getting people more, which mm -hmm. it is, we could, but at the same time, especially the people who are susceptible to both influenza and COVID, if one of them is more likely to kill them than the other, it's going to be COVID-19. But, mm -hmm. um, but based on that as well, sometimes there's like an economic disincentive for information that some places are declaring a COVID death if they get more compensation or support, especially that's happening more in America, I think. Whereas I don't know if, I don't think hospitals in Britain have the same negative incentive, you know, don't have an incentive to massage numbers and manipulate them to be able to exaggerate. I feel like exaggerations are a very small part of the problem. I feel like, I mean, like it's a similar, similar sort of things happening in Germany as far as I understand, but it is only like circumstantial evidence that they've been, if someone had died with COVID, but COVID wasn't the actual definite cause of death, they're not declaring it as a death yeah. because of COVID. They're declaring it, you know, somebody with COVID-19, but they had a heart problem and that was actually the underlying cause. And that's, there's some nuance to that. So in some scenarios, that sounds like the sensible thing, but it is also a good way of looking good on the public stage and the global guys stage of that, we're doing a good job. That press about the fact that asymptomatic spread of COVID-19 is rare, like no surprise, because it's asymptomatic. Like it's, it's quite insane. It's an actual article. Um, from who or whatever if you um, google it like you'll see suggesting that such spread is very rare <laughs> like, <laughs> so uh, yeah th i was surprised by that uh, statement uh, because uh, if i yeah over here i would like to, what we noticed that 80 percent of uh, the po the people who are affected uh, do not have any symptoms is it as much as 80? I thought I was thinking yeah. it was like... It is, yeah. in it is. So in the state that I live in, it's Maharashtra, uh, 50 to 60 percent are uh, asymptomatic. Uh, and the second highest uh, state is where the number of cases is in Delhi, uh, where the state the chief minister is claiming that around 70 to 80 percent are asymptomatic. So mm -hmm. when, that is, when I that's, that's, a, this that's group, a real this, problem. I, if, I don't know, so, but I saw that. this thing, I saw this, so I thought like, okay, what are they talking about? I mean, I, I've, I've heard that it's like, you know, I've heard and seen it, I've seen people discussing that they're thinking it's about 20 to 30%, which is still a dangerously high amount because they are literal invisible symptom carriers. They carry, they carry the, the illness without any symptoms, but... Um, but it's okay. I'm kind of feel like that's a very, very high, and like 80%. Yeah, and in, in a place like India, like we have like densities, population densities about like uh, 800 people, like in a place called Dharavi, we have one lakh people living in a small one acre by one acre place. Oh, okay. It's like it's social a slum business. area and like, yeah. And here, if you have a person who is asymptomatic, you can consider how dangerous it is. Yeah, that's, yeah, I've, yeah, yeah, I was sharing him. Um, yeah, where, like people are going out, and here we cannot go and do a test if you don't show any symptoms. You have to show some symptoms, 
either you should have have a cold you should have a cough something otherwise you cannot go and do a test where are mm-hmm. they getting this asymptomatic model idea from if they're not testing people more generally then i have no idea they are doing contact tracing so if mm-hmm. one person is infected they are going around testing everyone who is uh, who he has come in contact with okay and then they are calculating the numbers mhm that would that that would probably give you mo- a much higher increase to asymptomatic because you contact tracing potentially people before they get to symptoms because as we understand symptoms can be happen between 6 and 14 days so if you if you contact trace and find them within the first 3 days they're going to be asymptomatic but they might not be asymptomatic in a week when they get ill so i can i can sort of see how that could, but it means it, to a certain extent it means your local government is doing a really good job of contact tracing which is not a bad thing something my country is definitely not doing it's fl- falling all over the shop on contact tracing it's just not doing it at all mhm okay so yeah it's in, a really interesting topic and another topic actually that uh, would be uh, valid for us uh, because uh, if we'll get all the historical data so um 100 years ago and something exactly the same happened like like now so some professions uh, actually disappeared because of you know human contacts and uh, uh, basically we we can try actually uh, to recognize those professions with uh, help of machine learning and we can see what happened in like historical perspective and uh, i think this is quite fascinating topic because uh, exactly the same is happening now and uh, uh, we have some data already and we have some, some sources and we can actually predict what will happen this let's say tourism or horitsa or you know people involved in other um industries so it would be nice to understand what happened in in, in uh, like a uh, long time ago and uh, how we can help uh, researchers to uh, convince policy makers to change something would would this be examples like you say you're talking about tourism you know the hotel chain hotel industry recreational yeah. things they're all going to be very very strongly affected but are you are you thinking based on are we going to be doing sampling from data or are we going to be looking at like sentiment analysis of the social media because yeah. you can get an idea of where people you know what kind of roles people work in and then that can give you an idea of their you know it's supposedly manufacturing is on the up right now which feels like a really unusual thing in Britain but at the same time mm-hmm. manufacturing is probably more confident because a lot of manufacturing industry jobs are fairly dispersed you know even if you're in a factory you might mm-hmm. not be within 20 feet of someone if you're running a machine by yourself so i can see why people in that industry might not be feeling as worried as people like my staff got family members who work in um like yeah rest- restaurants and bars and stuff and these things are just like just not opening at all and there's a, there's going to be a massive backlash and a massive effect economically yeah. politically socially so it would be really interesting to look at them especially you know on a local level on a global skew to give us an idea where you know like I said some some jobs might not necessarily go away but they might shrink for a very long time mhm and if you remember what happened act- actually after uh, spanish flu st- start so we had revolution in russia and uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, bad things like, like happened in germany when hitler came to power and uh, so basically there is also a reflection on on common situation on political uh, movements right so it would be nice to understand uh, how all these kind of uh, pandemia that change in political landscape in the world also you'd have to you'd struggle to be able to dis, uh, disconnect the end of world war 1 and the pandemic it was like mm-hmm. a, do- a double whammy one after the other you know and also the fall of the end of world war 1 started the full decline of a lot of colonialist empire and you know it, it was towards the end of the british empire which is obviously had by that point a very yeah. strong and negative strong negative influence on lots of geopolitical things the american empire which we will carry describe as an empire but was was growing from its strength and its money from the british empire's fall um there was much more independence movements and social movements in in example like russia's um 
throwing off the Zarist regime. There's lots and lots of like political change all through that period. So, but it's but people forget like everything's changing all the time. It's just then big moments that look like a really odd, odd you know strong pivot. And mm. I think it'd be really interesting to yeah see if there's any data related to that. But it sounds like we're buying enough more than we could chew more than not right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. And I see a very interesting uh, suggestion from uh, Tamana, and she said we can cat categorize the group of jobs, uh, job domains affected by COVID. So basically, I have a few databases of jobs, and uh, we can immediately start to think how to build a machine learning uh, model uh, to recognize all those jobs and to see if we can apply these models to historical texts. So, um, I think a lot of people can, can be interested to, to do that because it's also quite valuable data set. And uh, if we will manage to produce these kind of models, of course, we'll get different uh, historians just coming to us and asking because they already collected a lot of own uh, data sources. So they'll get possibility probably to uh, rerun the same pipelines for them themselves and to get something new, new insights and uh, yeah, it's going to be a very interesting process, I would say. And uh, Tamana, uh, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, you want Tamana to speak? Yeah. So, yeah, please. Tamana, can, can you explain a little bit, uh, elaborate about your idea? We don't hear you. She's on mute. Oh, you're mute. <coughs> she might she might not be there right now. It's fine. We'll continue and then just ask her again in a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so okay. I, I was wondering. Hello, everyone. Yeah, I have to find a spot where I can speak. My husband is in call. My kids are in call. So yeah, it's crazy out here. Life of Sorry, calls. guys. Mm. Uh, yes, Slava, uh, Slava, did I, am I pronouncing your name correctly? Yes. Uh, you said you have data set. Uh, could you please elaborate like uh, what data set you are having? What is the type of? Mm -hmm. Okay, so so uh, I have data set on. Uh, data yeah. you have with me? Oh, it was uh, elaborate, like what data you are having? You said you are having some uh, database on um, by which we can um, which we can use to categorize the job domains yeah. affected by COVID. Yeah. So, so uh, you have collected those data from where? No, uh, actually, professions. Uh, all professions we, we already collected in different European projects. So we have. Um, data sets consisting of all uh, professions with this labeling and uh, this uh, time, let's say, when uh, these, those professions were popular. And uh, we can use these professions right now for some machine learning tasks. And I have this data, database in Dutch and uh, I think in English and uh, probably in some other languages, uh, even like uh, Eastern European languages like Czech or uh, Slovak and you know this kind of stuff. Oh, wow. So, uh, so Good. it's uh, I, I will share all links after this meeting and uh, you can just download and you can take a look and uh, to see. Sure, sure, that will yeah. definitely help me. Uh, please do share the link and uh, we'll we um, then uh, I think uh, we can uh, we can plan out like what we we can do later. Um, mm -hmm. We can plan out what will be the, our uh, our path to categorize. And in the meanwhile, uh, we keep on like uh, we, we, we we all will be observant. Like we will all be seeing what all things are going on. I hear that um, like uh, someone said, let me get the name, please. Uh, Tyler. Tyler. Yeah, Tyler. That manufacturing are not manufacturing will will have a tough time way ahead in many cases. But uh, I hear few uh, 
few um, automobiles companies are getting the getting so much demand they are not able to fulfill this has happened like uh, last two months so so the so the so the what i'm trying to say here is the pattern is very irrelevant at times and in some cases so we have to identify that what all manufacturing not all manufacturing are going to suffer few are going to get peaks so we have to categorize them means we when we will get the numbers when we will get the data and we'll use the data on the model then we will get to know the real picture like 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 what our industries are going to face like i am in education and i i i am uh, now facing a problem of finding a good job in uh, in education domain in canada but um, i can see few in few education um, few education uh, organizations are, are going to prosper like udemy edurica coursera which are um, completely online so we have to you know we have to go into the detail like uh, what all are going to suffer and what all going to get the advantage of these things i mean like tech and digital is going to come out of this yes, 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 more yes. more powerful more, and more more, more influential than, than it than than it ever has and it's yes. not for any other reason than people have realized that these tools have gone from being a niche to situational to absolutely necessary and that's going to fundamentally change you know and, and i i'm in education as well not in i work with i work in primary schools but it's the same sort of thing i'm having questions now like i've not worked in a school since the beginning of march and i might not be back in schools until i don't know when <laughs> i don't know when that might happen so I, but at the same time i've already i've decided i'm moving into tech anyway i'm trying to train into that sort of space but i'm curious about what's going to happen because even silly things like entertainment the entire, entire entertainment industry is not it's not suffering you know especially with gaming the gaming media um you know tv you know the creative industries they're all doing just fine as long as it's not people centered you know obviously like live musicians are suffering like like nobody else to the level of they just have a job so there's there's just like really there's lots of new ones on interest in there again it's something that i'm interested in to see where we go with it but yeah there's lots of let's be fair there's lots of problems and lots of data and and we can economize and historically analyze basically everything we just how many people and what are we going to do with it so i think yeah the concentrate on maybe the, the where, where we okay slava where are we thinking first steps is where you're going to look i'll let you go with that yeah so f f first we should we should think about sources and uh, of course we, we should uh, put all uh, available sources in our dataverse and uh, yeah we need more people to get on board and uh, start to bring different ideas how we are going to proceed so they're basically it's the first time when we are discussing this so it's like nice momentum basically it's just conceptualizing and play with it a yeah. little bit i'm yeah. just worried that, that yeah i'm worried that some people like like you for example who are already busy doing lots of different things in lots of places but i understand why you're looking at this because um once the infrastructure is built and the dataverse works all it will need is your guidance after that point and you want to try and get into yeah. what else yeah. can i put in there and what else can i expand on this what else can i develop and what else can i grow because you don't want to just sit around and go well it works yeah so i yeah uh, I, and, and, and i'm going to be the same soon when i eventually when we eventually organize the community management side of things and now can automate some of that i'm going to yeah i'll be going looking for other things to fill myself with and time and learn and learn from and, and hopefully mm -hmm. learn from you guys so i'm looking forward to seeing what you guys come up with and joining in with conversations occasionally <laughs> okay uh sorry guys i have to go now uh, and uh thanks for this call and uh i think uh, yeah it it would be nice i think to make next call like next week what do you think about that is it enough time yep uh, You know, I'll um, saw, I'll saw, in, in docs, we should, we should, yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, tell. I'll, um, I'll put, I'll pop a doodle poll 
for like next week and we'll work out some time windows that work for people and then and then from the you know we'll work out when mm -hmm. we will speak again and then i'll give us time to be able to discuss some points maybe we'll put up a document and we can sprint brainstorm ideas brainstorm what 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 problems can we can what problems exist within this space and what what mm -hmm. tangible solutions can we offer because yeah we could just conceptualize all day long but if we can't offer any tangible solutions we're just intellectually entertaining ourselves and that's it mm -hmm. okay okay sorry I, I have to go right now so thanks again guys see you soon thanks everybody thanks thanks, everyone. thanks bye. thank you thank you